Okay, so welcome everyone. We have with us today uh, Dan Visokai or Visotsky from uh, University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, formerly a PhD student at Rochester Institute of Technology in New York, uh, now in Milwaukee. And he'll tell us about constraining multiple source populations from the second gravitational wave transient catalog from library. Good luck, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so thanks for introducing me and uh, for inviting me to give this talk, OFEC. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to go over, um, well, first, just a little bit of background on what LIGO has seen and constrained so far, which I'm guessing a lot of you are familiar with, um, and then go into a little bit of uh, why is Zoom blocking out my, OK. Um, and then go into a little bit of um, uh, reanalysis, partial reanalysis of what LIGO has already done using open data, um, which you can reproduce with a link at the end of my talk if you're interested in uh, learning how some of this, this stuff is done. Um, and also one new analysis. Um, so just to give a little bit of background, um, recently, and recently being now a number of months ago, um, LIGO has uh, produced their second gravitational wave transient catalog, GWTC2. Um, and on this figure, you can see in the blue circles um, uh, an approximation of all of the binary black holes that LIGO has seen merge. Um, is my, actually, is my cursor visible? Yeah. Is that a yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so you can see all of the um, the binary black holes that LIGO has seen with, uh, you know, pairs merging into a larger black hole, um, as well as a few binary neutron stars and a couple sort of ambiguous things, in particular uh, this object merging up here. Um, and so, you know, looking at what LIGO has seen so far, um, we're, we're really starting to fill in the mass space. Um, Whereas previously we had, you know, a few scattered events. Um, taking a little more rigorous view of that previous figure, here is the second catalog's um, uh, set of events. Um, actually, this is just uh, events that were new in the second catalog. There's some stuff missing here. Um, and what you can see plotting the total mass versus the mass ratio um there's sort of this big cluster of events out at high mass um and some outliers potentially um and then some things at lower mass um and then one thing that's that uh seems like it's probably a binary neutron star although you know we don't have an em transient or a em counterpart this time to uh confirm it like we did with uh gw 170817 um as well as some high mass ratio or higher mass ratio events that are a bit more interesting. Um, so using all of these detections, as well as the previous catalogs, um, one might ask, you know, what is the distribution of masses? And you can, you can try to eyeball it from this, um, but, you know, because obviously these are not point estimates, but posterior distributions, um, there's uncertainty in where each individual event goes, um, like where the actual true value is. Um, and in addition to that, our sensitivity is not constant across mass space. So the fact that we see this cluster here, well, that's partly because at higher masses, we're more sensitive. So in reality, like astrophysically, the abundance of black holes in this region uh, is going to be lower, relatively speaking, to these uh, lower mass black holes, just based on the fact that we're more sensitive here. So we're going to see more of them, even if they're, you know, even if there was an equal number of both. Um, so we need to factor all of that in when, um, you know, when we try to estimate the mass distribution. Um, so the LIGO Virgo collaborate, LIGO Virgo Cagra collaboration. Um, did such an analysis uh, back after, like right when GWTC2 was released. Um, 
And, you know, you basically, if you don't want to have an infinite number of parameters, you need to have a model. Um, so there were several different mass models, and we'll see later, there were a number of spin models used as well. Um, and they all produce this sort of um, consistent, you know, this, this relatively consistent continuum fit, um, whether you have the truncated model, which is just fitting the continuum, the broken power law, which is basically allowing for um, two different continuums. Um, there's the power law plus peak, which fits for a tapered continuum, basically. And when I say continuum, I just mean a power law, um, plus this ability to have an extra feature, um, which you know the model determines where, or sorry, the data determines where that feature should actually lie. Um, and then there's another extension of that called multi-peak, which allows for a second, uh, a second bump, um, which we're we're not as confident in in measuring. Um, you know, you can see it in the estimates here, but um, there's a lot of uncertainty here. So it's actually fully consistent with there not being a second peak. What's the gray rectangle? Oh, the gray rectangle is the location of that 30-ish solar mass uh, bump. Um, so based not on these, so so when you, it, it's a little misleading when you plot um, credible intervals versus mass. Um, if you actually plot the traces, the individual like you know, we have our posterior distribution on parameters for these models is what we're actually constraining. And so for each of those, you can plot a curve. And what has been done here is at a given mass, you say, what is, you know, um, well, first of all, what's the median? Um, actually, the, or we're plotting the mean here, never mind. Um, you can basically say, like, what is the fifth percentile and what is the 95th percentile at each of these? Uh, mass points for all of those curves, or at least for like a sample of a few thousand that you've drawn. Um, and that can be a little misleading, especially when you have um, when you have a feature that you don't know its exact location, it gets kind of washed out. So just looking at the, uh, the parameters, you can see that this bump basically occurs, uh, I believe this is our 90% uh, credible intervals. Um, so, you know, 5% of the time it lies under this value and 95% of the time it lies over this value. Um, you, you get a little bit of bias when you plot the, um, when you just plot the credible intervals or the mean here, um, because it's not, it, it can be biased by like a few that are very high, for instance. Um, you know, when, when you're taking a mean, for example, um, something that has a very low value is not gonna contribute very much to that calculation. Having one or two samples that are much higher is gonna bias this estimate. Um, so, uh, so, so actually this gray box is probably more informative than these actual curves, just in terms of where that uh, overabundance feature is located. Um, and in the case of the broken power law, it's not where the overabundance is, but where the break in the broken power laws, because uh, we basically can't distinguish, at least from GWTC2, whether, um, like, we we have a slightly better fit for this power law plus peak model, um, but the broken power law is also pretty good um, at describing that feature. So whether it's an overabundance around 30 solar masses or it's just a change in the, um, you know, just a change in the shape that winds up being fit by that bump, um, that's something that's still, we still need more data to really determine. Um, does that answer your question? Oops. Okay, I'll, we'll take silence as a yes. Um, so yeah, um, these are all pretty simple mass models. Um, going into the spin estimates, um, things also get a little more interesting. So. This is a plot of the chirp mass versus chi effective from the GWTC2 paper. Um, now, chi effective is describing, you know, multiple spin degrees of freedom all constrained into just one number. Um, so this isn't the full picture of 
of the spin, but it at least gives you some sense of what's going on. So just looking at the mass versus chi effective, one might ask, you know, is there some, is there some trend with mass in the spin distribution? Um, and, you know, if there is such a trend, it's really not going to be fully visible in this 2D slice. Um, but just looking at the events that we have, you know, you have these um, lower mass things, which seem to be biased a little bit towards positive chi effective. Um, and then when you go to higher mass, you get a much bigger spread. Now that may just be due to, you know, first of all, when I say a bigger spread, part of that is because these error bars are larger. Um, oh, I should, should have notifications on. Hopefully that, that doesn't, um, sorry, let me just turn off my LIGO chat notifications because that's going to get out of hand. Um, Sorry about that. Should have done that before. Okay, so um, you know some of some of this scatter is in part just due to the fact that the error bars are a bit larger um, out at high mass, um, at least for some events. But some of the scatter, you know, we have these these higher mass events, or sorry, we have these higher uh, effective spin events we have um we have ones that are consistent with lower spin so you you can still you can still ask you know looking at all of the spin degrees of freedom counting for selection effects counting for um you know um for the uncertainties in each event is this consistent with an evolving spin distribution um so uh so actually on this slide, I'm showing if you assume a fixed spin distribution, um, that's the true, that's true for all binary black holes in our catalog. Um, what we basically find is uh, assuming a beta distribution for the spin magnitudes and assuming a truncated Gaussian distribution for the cosine of the tilt angle, um, we find that basically there's a pretty strong preference for low spin magnitudes um, with plenty of plenty of dispersion, um, and for the tilt, we don't like to have things that are super sharply peaked at uh, alignment. Um, we are pretty consistent with having a lot of um, a lot of mis misaligned detections, um, but we still have pretty broad uncertainties in that. Now, if we take the same model and we say um using that mass model the power law plus peak uh or actually a slightly a simplified version of it um if we say for that model we allow for a different spin distribution using that same uh that same simple distribution from the previous slide um, but we allow the parameters to be different for the power law component and for the peak component um and also we allow spin one and spin two to be different. So we're not assuming both black holes are drawn from the same spin distribution. We can ask, you know, are those two distributions the same or not? Um, and so here I've plotted the parameters of the model rather than just the distributions. Um, so there are three parameters. There's the mean of that beta distribution on spin magnitudes. There's the variance on that. And then there's, it's not actually the standard deviation because it's a truncated Gaussian, but the, uh, you know, basically the width parameter for your truncated Gaussian on the cosine of the spin tilt. Um, and so one thing that we see is essentially for the power law, where we think there are more detections contributing, um, we, we get something that, you know, peaks at lower spin values. Um, which is pretty consistent with what we saw in the previous plot. Uh, for the Gaussian component, um, we're actually not as well constrained as we are with the power law component. Um, and just comparing to the prior here, um, we're maybe not too far away from the prior. Um, so while these two peak in different locations, you can see that there's a ton of overlap in their support. So 
at least for the mean parameter, um, we can't say that there's any uh, confirmed difference there. Um, the same is pretty much true for the variance parameter. Um, it is interesting to see, you know, how they differ. So with the Gaussian, we have um, uh, we have more broad distributions, which makes sense when you look back at that chi-effective distribution here. Uh, in this bump, we have, you know, we have this greater dispersion here. Um, so there's at least support for that, um, or more support for that. Um, but really, we'll need more detections to be able to definitively say whether these distributions are different and to what degree. Um, and also for the uh, spin tilts, um, uh, basically both are consistent with everything that we put in. Um, but there's a stronger uh, a stronger preference for misaligned spins in that Gaussian component, which you know lies around 30-ish solar masses. Um, so these were all LVK results, uh, just from, uh, published papers by the collaboration. Um, now for the rest of the, for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to take LIGO's data and run my own analyses. Um, and I have a link at the end, if you're interested in reproducing it, because all of the, all of the code and all of the data is openly available. Um, and you can reproduce this yourself if you're interested in getting into population analysis work. Um, so um, just to go into a little more detail, I'm actually going to repeat that same analysis. The, uh, this was called the multi-spin model. Um, I'm going to repeat that analysis, but go into a little more detail than what appeared in the LIGO paper. Um, so this is a, this is a uh, complete you know, rerun using the open data, not using LIGO resources directly. Um, although it is exactly the same model and almost exactly the same code um, with some, you know, slight tweaks in terms of um, uh, using, uh, you know, just redoing things uh, and improving things on, on my end. Um, so just to go into a little more detail on what this model actually is, uh, multi-spin, uh, essentially, if you look at the M1, M2 plane, uh, our model says we allow for this power law uh, continuum that fills in, um, you know, for all binary black hole masses. So above three solar masses is our constraint. Um, and we don't know the slope of this power law. We don't know where it, uh, like what the minimum mass is. We don't know what the maximum mass is. We allow the data to determine that. Um, although we do constrain it to be at least three and no more than a hundred. Um, and, in addition to that, we have this Gaussian component, which um, we sort of fix to be, uh, I, I don't have the prior written right in front of me, but um, we do fix it to be at higher masses. Um, so we don't wind up fitting something down here, um, just in terms of you know making things converge in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and so the big difference between this and say the power law plus peak model, which is pretty similar um, is for one, this is a 2D Gaussian. So we allow for it to have a different location in M1 and M2. Um, and mo more importantly, we assign a separate spin distribution to each, um, to each of these subpopulations. Um, and uh, if we run this through our population inference framework, um, we constrain both the mass distribution and the spin distribution, and we can even look at what the separate constraints are on each subpopulation. Um, so looking at the mass distribution, um, we see that this is sort of our overall constraint on uh, the probability of an astrophysical object having a given uh, M1. Um, and like with all of the uh, LIGO mass models, you know, we, we constrain that there is definitely some feature around 30 or 40 solar masses um, and things fall off when you get uh, up to higher masses. Um, but something that wasn't done in the LIGO analysis is just looking at, you know, individually for each subpopulation, um, you, can, you can pick out what, um, you know, what the distribution is within each subpopulation 
Um, and while this is a pretty simple model and probably not too informative in terms of you know, these multiple subpopulations, since it is just, we assume it's a power law, we assume it's a Gaussian. Um, uh, one thing we're working on right now is doing uh, basically a simplified Gaussian mixture model, um, which those results aren't uh, converging yet. So I, I won't be showing them today, but um, one thing that you can do with that is you can actually start to look at each subpopulation start to see you know what differences uh, in terms of the masses and spins exist within these multiple components um, and you know that can be informative for one when you're getting new detections um, you know if if you're sort of able to describe that you know this this subpopulation um, comparing it with simulations you know is most likely to come from a particular channel you know that can be informative um, for any new detection um uh so yeah this this is just one interesting result uh looking at the uh the different spin distributions um pretty much the only difference between this figure and this figure is that this used a kde to plot it and this used a histogram um, but they're pretty much entirely consistent with each other um so it's good to see that we were able to reproduce the same result using um the publicly available data. Um, now, this was all largely a primer for um, for something else that we're interested in, which is um, previously I was just showing you black holes. LIGO has seen more than just black holes. Um, it's definitely seen some neutron stars. It's also seen some events that are a little bit ambiguous. And so, one motivation for trying to fit multiple populations at the same time is in the case, if we go back here, um, you know, in the case of events which are a little more ambiguous. So for instance, GW 190814 here, um, it, so one of its components is definitely a black hole. Um, but if you look at the mass ratio here, M2 is less than three solar masses, um, although it it is quite a bit higher than we would expect for a neutron star, but also quite a bit smaller than we've ever seen for a black hole. Um, so it may be, you know, a, a much more massive neutron star than we expected was possible, or it may just be a very small black hole. And so if you're if you're trying to fit uh, the black hole and neutron star mass distributions and spin distributions simultaneously, um, you can allow the data to sort of determine where an individual event should go. And if it's ambiguous, it can, you know, it can sort of probabilistically contribute to both uh, both constraints. So uh, to do this, we basically extended the multi-spin model. So this is an entirely new analysis. Um, and so extending multi-spin, uh, which is this upper triangle, um, which only applies to binary black holes, uh, we added in two additional Gaussians. Um, and there's some, there's some particular constraints on these Gaussians to make them, uh, you know, well-described binary neutron stars or neutron star black holes. Um, so for one, LIGO doesn't have many neutron star containing detections, even if you assume all of the ones that could be neutron stars are. Um, so our constraints are gonna be pretty prior dependent um, to, to sort of alleviate that a little bit and just try to get some better constraints in the short term, uh, which are gonna re rely on a little more assumptions. Um, one thing we did was uh, we assumed that there is one Gaussian distribution in mass that describes all neutron stars. So in this binary neutron star component, this is a 2D Gaussian where both components have the same mean and same standard deviation. In this neutron star black hole component, uh, at least for the, the neutron star portion of that, we assume it has that same Gaussian. Um, we allowed for a different Gaussian for the black hole component, um, which we wind up not constraining very well with the limited number of potential detections being so small. Um, 
you know, less than one detection uh, confidently. So, um, you know, putting this all together, having one model that fits all detections allows you to simultaneously and self consistently fit for things like, you know, the merger rate of different subcategories. Um, it allows you to see if there's any evidence for a mass gap between these. So we, we assume that neutron stars have some maximum mass, um, uh, which is just a parameter for our model. Um, so that in that sort of imposes this truncation here. Um, and we also, our black hole model has a minimum mass. So that imposes a lower truncation here. We allow the data to determine where those should be and whether there's a difference between them or not. Uh, there's this little caveat with because we used a Gaussian distribution for the neutron star black holes, um, and we didn't put in a minimum mass cutoff because, I mean, first of all, we wouldn't have any constraints on it with, without enough detections to do that. Um, that's going to sort of bias us towards saying that there probably isn't a, or there definitely isn't a absolute mass gap in the sense that there are no sources in this, in this region. Um, but we can still look for an underabundance. So putting all of this together and running our analysis, um, we get a similar figure uh, to what I showed you before, except now with three subpopulations, and really four if you count the fact that the binary black holes are broken into the power law and the uh, Gaussian components. Uh, but I won't, I won't separate those in this figure. Um, so looking at the overall mass distribution, uh, we see basically, um, so actually, if you, if you look closely at some of these curves, we have support for sort of binary neutron stars that obey a Gaussian that just drops off naturally, or binary neutron stars where the Gaussian has a sharp cutoff due to that maximum mass. And we would expect that from, oops, if, if the neutron star mass distribution sort of intrinsically goes high enough, we'd expect there to be some truncation due to um, the equation of state only allowing for neutron stars up to a certain mass. Um, and so based on these constraints, you know, we're not able to distinguish just yet which of those two scenarios is the case. Um, we need more detections to do that. Um, and then past that, we see that there's basically, uh, there's basically an underabundance before things turn back up for the black holes. And so looking, sort of zooming in on um, like a per subpopulation basis, we can see what's going on here. So we can see that, um, well, because we imposed that there's no neutron star bigger than three solar masses, which is a pretty reasonable constraint, um, there's a hard cutoff at three. Um, that's really a prior uh, assumption, but I think that's a reasonable one. Um, and then we have, we have some gap between, um, you know, between the binary neutron stars and the binary black holes. Um, so just looking at the 90% uh, credible region, um, there, there is pretty strong evidence of a gap there, but that is dependent on the fact that um, we have a hard cutoff in our binary black hole mass distribution. Um, for the binary neutron stars, on the other hand, um, we basically are able to go down, like we, we basically have distributions that, you know, could peak over here, or they could go all the way down to um, uh, the lowest value we allowed, which was two solar masses. Um, and so in that case, based on just GWTC2 and based on this, you know, pretty simple model, all things considered. Um, we're basically able to say either there is, uh, there's, there's a small amount of probability that there is a actual hard mass gap um, where there are no sources between a certain range um, for the neutron stars and black holes on either end. Um, but more of our support, and this is partly due to the fact that we don't have constraints on the neutron star black holes, uh, more of our support is for there being just an underabundance. So not, um, you know, not a gap in the truest sense, but maybe, uh, you know, a, 
uh, hole, sort of like just a, a, a region between neutron stars and black holes where there are fewer detections than um, on either end. Um, and so to really constrain this, you know, beyond just, you know, part of this is just due to the fact that we have a simple model, make certain assumptions, it's going to, it's going to find things like this. Um, but as we get more detections um, in O3b and O4 and future surveys, um, I think we're going to start to see this, uh, these constraints tighten. Um, and I think we'll have a more definitive answer to whether or not, um, you know, there's a, there's a gap between neutron stars and black holes. Um, but, you know, that's going to require more data to really, uh, to really nail that down. Um, am I, am I, was I reading correctly that the um, black holes merging with neutron stars generally tend to higher masses than the black holes merging with black holes? So, um, so I think part of that is, um, is possibly a prior effect. So for instance, uh, so binary black holes, at least much of the mass distribution is pretty well fit by this continuum that's falling off. Um, and so they're more likely to, they're more likely to uh, uh, peak at the low mass end, or pretty much there's no support anymore for a peak anywhere else, um, or at least like the main peak. Uh, but um, for this, um, for this neutron star black hole case, uh, we basically just have a Gaussian distribution that's allowed to peak anywhere on the mass range. And here, for instance, this is a log scale. So there's going to be more, um, there's going to be more regions that are uh, at higher mass. Um, now, like the difference between say 25 solar masses and 50 solar masses here, like there's plenty of, there's plenty of support for the neutron star black holes all being, you know, in this sort of mid range uh, and falling off before the, the very high mass. So in that sense, binary black holes have more support for, uh, or potentially have more support for um, uh, much higher masses. Um, but yeah, this is partly just due to the fact that we don't have good constraints. And if your prior assumption is we don't know the answer, it's, it could be anything with equal probability. Um, that's going to sort of spread you out to, um, to appearing to be at higher masses. Um, now, if this if this held up or this sort of like tightened um, as we got to um, you know as we got to getting a significant number of neutron star black holes and really constrained this distribution, I think that would then be you know a result worth writing home about. Um, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't read into that just yet, based on um, based on this, which is at this stage, it's more of a proof of concept, considering that we don't have the data to really constrain it. If that answers your question. So, methodologically, did you try to run produce a plot like this with the same prior for the primary for BBH and NSBH mm. black holes, just so the comparison and the plot is kind of on equal footing? So I would, that would probably give a pretty crazy result, um, but maybe doing two Gaussians for the BBH, just so you could sort of fit, fit this feature and this feature. I think that would actually be interesting to look at. Um, we are looking at something a little more uh, general than that actually, um, uh, sort of like a Gaussian mixture model with more components, um, which the thing about Gaussian mixture models is that, uh, uh, they don't like to converge sometimes, um, so we're we're still we're still getting that uh, that to be sampling at a reasonable uh, reasonable rate. Um, so I was I was hoping to have results from that to show today, but um, it's it's been a pain getting getting that to work correctly. But yeah, I think um, I think even just in that simpler model. Um, no, I, I would still expect for, well, for a two component Gaussian, I would expect to see similar results here for the binary black holes. 
Um, um, and yeah, just using a single Gaussian to describe all the binary black holes, I think just the prior for that would be so bad that I don't know how to how you would interpret the results from that. Just like but it, it would either just try to fit this low mass peak um, plus a little bit of smudging to higher masses from trying to account for this, or it might sort of like interpolate um, and and sort of just do a, a single peak that fits everything in between. Um, but I, I think you would get some kind of weird results just by just by the fact that it's not, um, you know, but we we have enough data to say that the binary black hole mass distribution is definitely not Gaussian. Um, I think it definitely has some some features to it. Um, so yeah. And one more question on these type of plots: Why do you normalize the the y-axis by the mass? Um, Does that slam the, the the result against high mass events? So, okay, so what we're plotting here is basically, um, so you have the, so if you were to just write, um, not the rate, but um, the mass distribution, so the probability, like the, the probability density of a merger occurring at any given mass, that's going to have units of per solar mass or per mass. Um, so that's where this per, per M comes in. Um, and then we're just scaling that by the overall rate uh, that we that we get. Um, you could multiply this all by M1. Um, some people like to do that, um, but I, I don't know that that's necessarily weighing, like that would in a sense be, doing, doing something like that would be in a sense how you're adding in uh, like a weighing by mass, whereas this is, um, you know, it's just the units more so than, um, more so than something that we're we're putting in. Does that make sense? Okay, how are we doing with time? If I count event. Sorry, say it again. If I look at the area under these curves in some sense, is that mm. number of events or is that, I guess, um, mass per, ev per event, per type of events or what, what would that give me? Uh, if you were to integrate out the area under one of these curves and you would have to pick like one of the traces, not the, not the uh, overall constraint, that would just give you the fraction, or that would give you the merger rate, like the total merger rate within that curve. If that makes sense. Merger rate per gigaparsec cubed per year? Yeah. Without the mass? Without the mass, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so if you were to multiply on by mass, I guess you would get like a mass rate product. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, so the next figure, I guess actually, I forgot I had this figure, this sort of zoomed in on the mass gap region, but I already, already talked about that. Um, uh, but sort of gives you a little bit of a better uh, close up view of what's going on there. Um, and aside from that, um, that's, that's actually um, all I have for today. Um, if you want to reproduce some of these results, um, these are actually, uh, runs that I did for the uh, APS uh, meeting this year. So um, if you go to this URL here, uh, you can download all of the code that was used to generate these, uh, these results and run it yourself. Um, these take a little bit of time to run, but you know, if you're interested in doing population analyses, this is a, this is a good place to get started. Um, just to summarize some of the things we've seen uh, in these in these uh, constraints, um, it's pretty clear that there is a feature in the mass spectrum around 30 to 40 solar masses for binary black holes. Um, and you know, our result is consistent with what 
be like exactly consistent with what the LIGO Virgo Cagra result was. Um, uh, based on current observations, we can't really distinguish whether spins change within that feature. Uh, again, consistent with what the LVK is, has uh, constrained. Um, uh, based on our simple model, um, you know, there's there's a favoring of a significant mass gap. Um, and actually, I, I didn't touch on this too much, but um, for for these constraints to make sense. Um, you basically need GW 1908-14 to be a neutron star black hole. Um, and this may be in part, uh, this is something else I should have touched on. This may be in part due to our prior on this power law component here. Um, so our model assumes that there is a minimum mass parameter that describes exactly where this corner of the triangle is. Um, one thing that that does is it um, it doesn't allow m1 and m2 to have a different minimum so one might imagine having a instead of a triangle sort of a, a chopped off uh, like a triangle with the end chopped off as your model so if you have one m min for the primary mass and one m min for the secondary mass that can allow m2 to go down to lower masses without throwing off your uh, m1 distribution and so um, part of why our results are mostly consistent with 1908-14 being a NSBH um, may be due to the fact that uh, we really don't want to pull down the M1 limit too far. Um, and so if we allow the M2 limit to go down further than the M1 limit, um, you might see that result change. Um, so that's something to, to look out for. It's, it's actually a pain to, uh, to change our model to allow for that. Um, we need to redo all of the, all of the algebra. So that's, that's something that's a work in progress. Um, and yeah, I'd like to acknowledge all the funding agencies that made this possible and uh, uh, mention that this material is uh, based upon work supported by the NSF's LIGO laboratory. Um, which is funded by the, the National Science Foundation. So yeah, um, thank you all. And we have plenty of time for questions, I think. First of all, let's, let's uh, thank Dan. Now uh, let's have questions. Asaf? I didn't fully get, maybe this, I missed that part. So do you believe that 1908-14 was a neutron stars uh, black hole or a black hole black hole? So I don't believe either way. Um, our model believes that it's an NSPH. Um, but that that is going to be like, there's a pretty simple, at least in principle, change we can make to our model that would remove that constraint, I think. Um, if we just allow binary black holes to have a little bit more flexible of a mass distribution. Um, um, it, yeah, so there are some tweaks we could do to our, our BBH model that would allow it to fit for 1908-14. But as it's constructed right now, it basically, um, by allowing for 1908-14 to be a BBH, you throw off the rest of the black hole distribution. Um, so uh, at least within this model, it would have to be an outlier uh, to be a BBH. And that's why it winds up being absorbed into the NSBH population. But I think in principle, it could be either. Um, what's, the, what's the limits uh, on the mass of the neutron star if it was a neutron star? So it winds up being, it, it winds up being just based on our previous understanding of neutron stars, it looks like it's probably not an NSBH. Um, but there's at least a small amount of room, like a small amount of wiggle room where it could be. Um, it would just be sort of a high mass outlier. Um, I, I forget off the top of my hand, off the top of my head, what the exact constraints are, but I think it's pretty much confirmed to be over uh, 2.3 solar masses. Um, like the, the posterior pretty much goes to zero before that. Um, so based on that, it's pretty extreme for like EOS constraints for neutron stars. Um, you know, there, there could be ways in which 
you could make something like that. Um, it, but you know, just based on the fact that there's no EM counterpart, um, I don't think you would even necessarily expect to see one um, for that event. Um, it's just a bit hard to tell whether you know whether LIGO is probing some high mass end of neutron stars that we previously didn't know about, um, or if it's just a previously unprobed low mass neutron star, or sorry, low mass black hole region. Um, and I think as we get more detections and we get more detections that have EM counterparts consistently, um, I think we'll be able to tell that a bit better. Um, or if we just have better EOS constraints, but um, you know, maybe, maybe nicer will be able to help out with that. Um, but so far, so far it's not necessarily been um, adding to that constraint um, on the high mass end. And you know, it tends to be a bit hard to tell with the high mass end just because of um, so for instance, a lot of um, a lot of electromagnetic uh, neutron star studies. Um, it, it can be a bit ambiguous whether the fact that you don't see neutron stars above a certain mass is because the equation of state gets truncated there, or if it's because whatever channel produces, you know, pulsars um, that that channel either has a hard cutoff before then sort of astrophysically and not based on the equation of state, or it's sort of a smooth um, fall off before then. And we're just not, you know, that channel doesn't produce any for us to see, whereas potentially LIGO, uh, you know, LIGO is seeing a different, um, uh, a different population. So I, I think it's still sort of, it's still sort of up in the air. I'm sure there are lots of people who are convinced one way or the other, but I think um, you know. I still, I think, I think nature has the ability to surprise us here still. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Dan again. Uh, thank you. Coming. There is no seminar next week, but there is one in two weeks. So I'll see you guys then. I think that uh, also you might mention that there is this uh, student's uh, seminar tomorrow. Students yes, 10, 10 a.m. Uh, close to Tel Aviv University uh, at the uh, Center for a Beautiful Israel. Matale Israel Efa. Students are most welcome. Great. Thank you all for having me. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Good luck. Bye. 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 I hope at some point you'll come uh, visit <laughs> physically. At some point, maybe. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Bye. Bye.